Hey, D, what should we talk about for our teaser today? Mm, the weather? Though you aren't supposed to start podcasts by talking about the weather. Says who? We we had some pretty windy nights this past week, so we had some weather and it got down into the teens on several days. So our weather is cold. It's really cold right now. It's only up to 39 and it was down to 22 this morning. That's pretty cold for this time of year. But that's it. Nothing much. Yeah. But did that stop us from gardening, D? Cold weather, winds? No. I plumped a few bul- bulbs in the wait, soil. I wait. may go out there today. Wait a minute. The teaser part, D, was we're, we're supposed to say, we're not telling. And oh. then, why don't you start this episode? <laughs> Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden an acre and a half out of seven and a half acres out in the country. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's about a third of an acre. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want you to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Good morning, Dee. Good morning, Carol. I feel like I need to explain why I was off, off kilter on her teaser quickly. Ready? Go ahead. Go ahead. Ever since the update on my computer, I cannot silence notifications. And right now, my neighbors are all talking to each other about a mislaid package. And so it's dinging in my ears. But And we didn't, I couldn't figure it out before we got on here. So as soon as I'm done, that's the first thing I'm going to do. Then I'm going to go fix my insurance, which thinks I'm 23. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I wish I were not- 23. <laughs> There is not such excitement here, so why don't I tell you what has been going on in my garden? We recorded five <laughs> days ago, so we're back to so, our Friday yeah. morning. So in that five days, it did turn bitterly cold, like down into the teens. And yesterday morning, I thought, ooh, I left those violas out in those pottery bowls or clay bowls on the porch. Whoops. Um, I ran, grabbed them, and threw them into the garage, and I didn't know where to put them, so I put them on the bed of the truck. And then I am such a good girl that I went to Costco and I did not buy the planted amaryllis they had for sale. So that's good for you. And then we had, I probably would have, but okay. We had a bunch of wind and it, all the leaves that were on the back lawn, I thought, Oh, I got to get out there and rake those. They're all gone. And they're like to the edges by the fence. So now I can yeah. just use my new leaf back thing and I can suck them up and put them on the beds where I want them. So anyway, and I put on Instagram, I seem to have been adopted by a flock of European starlings. What are you up to this week? So I just want to be, I didn't write this down, but I want to ask you, did we talk, have I talked about how we took all the timers off the hoses? You did the- not. Last weekend when we meeting when we were meeting, like we're like having meetings, when we were recording, there was all the fall de roll and fiddle de dee. And oh my God, there's some leaks out there. So you didn't tell oh, us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that, that particular one is toast. We had removed all the other ones, but we missed that one. So what we did, what I did do is I went around last weekend after we recorded and I got all the hose reels into the shop which right. is our car one of our car garages we have six it's a big property so we have six of those so i wheeled all those in because bill can't do it because he's still using a walker and what else did i do i mean that's pretty much it i did that so, and then i but back up a minute so your time uh-huh. one of the timers was toast yeah it broke the timer and because it broke the timer it it won't work anymore so here's so, what you're going to do. So how are we going to solve this problem next year? You're going to number gonna, all your timers. Already and you're going to write a list and say, these are all my timers. And then in the fall, when you're putting them all away, you're going to check off the list. I love it when you act like you're my mother and tell me what to do. <laughs> it's my favorite part of our friendship. But actually, we didn't number them. But we do have pieces of tape on them that say where they are in the garden, which has really helped. Yeah, And I will tell Bill that, yes, we should probably number them. That's a good idea. And because he's the one who took them off before he had surgery. But anyway, so 
that's, we fixed all the hoses. I detached some of them from the house just in case it got really cold. Everything is all well. And then, then I, okay, so what did I write down that I did? Oh, I, I planted in quotes as in set my wax amaryllis in a soup tureen. And then I said the other one in an antique bowl. And then I covered them with sheet moss, sort of like what you did with your pots. Right. Your, yeah. They were bowls. And so I like this better this way. Something about them just sitting there as wax lumps just didn't do it for me. So no, no. I just They're... don't think it's as pretty. I think if you were a modernist or maybe a millennial who likes simplicity, it'd be great. But in any event, I copied you on that. Don't have to water those. They just sit there and grow. And then I, and they're growing. They're doing really well. And then I yes. tried to get the bulbs planted, but I only got a few planted. It was a crazy week. I started a new medication called Zolair, which is an injectable, which is supposed to really help. It takes about six months though. So we don't know yet. And I watered all my house plants, and I do that on Sundays. And the plants in the greenhouse, I do that once a week or twice a week. I finally got Bill convinced. Oh, and we fixed the propane heater. So I have two levels of heat, electric and propane. So they back up each other. We fixed that and Bill fixed it actually. And then he looked on YouTube and they showed how to blow it out and all that. So that's on. But I convinced him finally that we do not need it 70 degrees in the greenhouse. I need it no, about you do 60, not. 60, yes. 55. That's the sweet spot because then you don't get as many bugs. You don't get uh, that everything doesn't dry out fast. It's just better all around. So yes. because the plants need to know it's not summertime. So let's see what else that's. Oh, and I ran to the box store and got the stuff to do the amaryllis and helped a lady with a gardening question while I was there. She was standing in front of fertilizers. And I said, do you need some help? Because she clearly was stressed, right? And she turned around and she goes, I'm a regenerative farmer, but I don't know how to fertilize my house plants. And I said, well, they don't. And she goes, and I need an acidifier because I have very alkaline water coming from my well. And I said, well, you don't need to fertilize them much. So there you go. No. There you go. Very good. Let's play favorites. Your turn. So my favorite this week is, even though it was in the teens, when I ran out there to swoop up those viola bowls and put them in the garage, there were some nice flowers still on there. I picked all those and I put those in a little vase and it's sitting on the kitchen counter. It still looks cute as a button. But so I thought, well, you are now my favorites. Sure. That's it. It's e you know, it's easier to pick favorites in the winter because there's not as much to choose from. No, there is not. <laughs> So my favorite is probably the new Aglaonema that I bought. I bought a red one in a red pot from the box store and it's up on my mantle. And do you remember when I had that Aglaonema addiction yes. and I had like yes. five of them? Well, yes. I eventually lost them all because they can be a little finicky and, you know, et cetera. Some of them got, what is that nasty bug in the middle of winter that's mealy bugs? Fuzzy. Yes, some yeah, of them got bugs. mealy bugs and they got thrown in the trash. And so anyway, I you know, Hope Springs Eternal. So I bought it. I think it was 12 bucks. It was it was cute. You got me into those Aglaneo Nemas, and it was back in 20, early 2020. And I'll tell you, I bought one called Pontiac. I still remember it's called Pontiac, and it's a green with a silver on the leaf. Yeah. And I busted that thing into five pots because it was so big. And, you know, those have been doing really well, and I've got them throughout the house basically and then yeah. i bought the is it called red valentine or valentine red valentine mm -hmm. i busted that into three pots and it just languished and so i moved those all back to one pot this fall and we'll see and there's another one i can't remember it looks pathetic and a reasonable person would have thrown it out by now but let's go on to the question of the week <laughs> <laughs> can i say one thing before we do of course you can I think the silver and green ones and the white and green ones are easier to grow than the pink and the red. You don't and, think it's my superior gardening skills? Well, you just said that your ones that are pink and red are languishing. I'm actually helping you. Oh, okay. okay. And your silver one, I think I think that's part of it. And because it seems to me that the red and the pink ones 
rot off at the soil level really easy. Yes, they do. If you overwater them, they do. They Even do if you like don't, I mean, you really have to let them get dry as a bone. You know, they're just a strange plant, but I love them anyway. So here's our question of the week. And it comes from one of my favorite garden coaching clients and friend, Darla Heatley, who lives in Southern Oklahoma, because I also do these by Zoom. Hopefully someday I can do them in person again, but I can do ones out of town by Zoom. So what do you do when a bulb is already coming up that was planted last year? What do you do, Carol? Well, I don't do nothing. Me neither. I I have bulbs, especially the smaller daffodils, the narcissus, some starflowers, grape hyacinths. They have all sent up foliage and lots of foliage for the winter. And I just leave it be. And then in the spring, I mean, the flowers still come up. They look pretty. The foliage can sometimes look like the dickens, but I really don't worry about those bulbs. They'll take care of themselves. They will. The only time I've ever run into trouble is in like spring and we'll get one of those really bad cold snaps Uh and it'll burn the edges. But even then, the flower comes up just fine. Exactly. Those burnt edges break off. It's no big deal. But Darla Darla worries. So this is what I sold her. Tuck some mulch around it. Don't worry. That's excellent advice. So I'll do a quote and we'll talk about our flower topic. All righty. The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well, to leave the world a better place a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded, and that is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Oh, I love that. Yes. I love that. That's why we do this podcast. I mean, really, it is. It is. All right. Our flower of the week is the latest in the world of amaryllis. And no, it's not particular varieties. It's just about all the ways you can grow amaryllis. And we're talking about the ones that we're doing inside this time of year. Right. Not the other ones. So it's really hippie astrum. And there are all different kinds. And so first of all, you listed potted. Potted. And I call this the traditional way to pot them up in some soil. Usually you find kits, they have a plastic pot and they've got like that puck of soil that you soak in water. It's really core. Yeah, it's just a a puck of core. And you you can use that. You can also, by the way, our recommendation is to throw away that plastic pot because an amaryllis, when it's grown well, becomes very top heavy. And I have had more than one amaryllis in that plastic pot just plop over because it got too big. Yeah, they just go punk, especially if they're tall. And besides, that plastic pot is ugly. So just put it in your recycled plastic pot pile and take it back to the people who recycle that stuff. And then I think the best tip, so there, I have an Instagram where I showed people how to do this exact kit and we'll link to it. But seriously, you wrote one of the best tips on there, which is leave the shoulders of the bulb showing when you pot them up. Yes. Why is this, Carol? Because... I don't know why, because you don't want the bulb Drainage. all the way down in the ground and the ground Drainage. in the dirt. It's so they don't rot. Yeah. Rot. It's about rot. I mean, drainage is the wrong word, but rot because they're big, poor, not porous. Well, I mean, probably they are porous, but they're big, beefy bulbs and they're tropical. And so they will rot if you're not careful. And then I also take mine. And I sprinkle grit around the top or moss or something to make it more decorative. But the grit also helps it to dry out that top layer. That works with seeds too. So you also said you can grow amaryllis on a rock bed, same as paper whites. And you can. It feels to me when I have done this that my blooms are not as bright. They are a pale version of the ones I grow in soil. I'm not saying it makes a difference. It's just seemed to me that way when I've done it. Yeah. And I I actually watched an Instagram reel where a woman put like three amaryllis on a rock base and then she added paper whites around it. And I'm assuming that that grew to be quite lovely. But you don't want that water up over the bulb. You want it to barely touch the bulb. And she made a good point. As the roots grow, you don't have to have that water level way at the top 
just touching no. the bulb. You can have it no. much lower because it's the roots that are sucking up the water and they're way down there. So the bottom of that bulb, I know Carol knows this, but the bottom of that bulb is called the, ba- the basal plate, basal plate. And so when I used to force hyacinths all the time, one of the things they said was put the water, I used to do it in beautiful glass vases. They One of the things they said is you take that and you make it so that the water, the basal plate can just smell the water. Yes. And I think that's the best tip of all because the roots will go, oh, there's water there and they'll start to grow down. It's pretty miraculous. And growing things on rocks or in decorative vases where you can see all that action is really cool and fun. And I've done it a lot of times. The the heart, I mean, I think amaryllis are easier and so are paper whites because you don't have to refrigerate them and all that stuff. But it's all very fun. It is. And I'll tell you this, Dee, I own an amaryllis vase. I do too. I have two of them. They are ridiculous because totally once that ridiculous. once that bulb gets tall, it just flops over in that vase. That vase, there's there's no support for that big bulb, and so it just flops over. And the big you know. flower, yeah, I think they're ridiculous, and I'll I don't use them anymore. I may have given them away. One year, my hyacinth faces all. We had a bad cold front come through, and they were in the refrigerator. There were bulbs on vase in the refrigerator and a bunch of, I lost a bunch of my antique hyacinth faces and it kind of left a bad, yeah, it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. And so I haven't felt like doing it since. I think I've only got like 10 left and I used to have like 35, but that's okay. Things happen. That's okay. So the easiest, easiest, easiest way to grow amaryllis, and if our listeners are tired of hearing us talk about it, we do not apologize for anything. Waxed. (laughs) amaryllis are our new favorite so so easy oh so my gosh fun. so and they gross. finally perfected yes. it oh yeah great big bulbs and like right now ours have lots and lots of stems i can't tell you how many you and i have sold for costco they should like give us something because people keep texting me and going I went one. and i'm like good for you and then you can also get them online I'll see if I can find the link. There's another thing I was thinking about. Oh, I wanted to tell you about Maddie taking hers. Maddie made a tent. In uh-huh. her, you know, she's into that now. Tent forts, you know, the yeah. little blanket yeah. forts. And Megan saw her carrying around. I gave her three. So she's carrying around one of those bulbs with her. And Megan goes, Maddie, what are you doing with that? And she goes, I'm taking it with me into my tent. Of course and she I is. Said, of course she is. <laughs> That's so good. she's having a lot of fun. This is a great thing to do with kids. Great it is. Thing. Now, the thing that, and I've, I've given them away too, and people say, well, first of all, they can't believe it works. It does work. It totally I mean, works. And I don't know why. Because you remember when you have an amaryllis in a box, I'd open that box. And a lot of times that thing is already be growing. Yes. Growing and practically blooming later in the season. So, you know, it works, but they always want to know, can I plant it afterwards? And so, okay. I mean, you you could try. try, but it's Some like people did when they first came out. They peeled off the wax. Yeah, I'm thinking, no, you're just going to no. get rid of that and buy a new waxed one next year because they're so easy. Like you said, Maddie loves hers. They're easy for kids. A woman in my nursing garden homes. Club, yes, she bought one. She she thanked me, sent an email, and said thanks for the tip. I must have said something at Garden Club. Raved like a lunatic. <laughs> God, did you, did you guys go to Costco and see the? Anyway, that's the best one. buy I've seen on them. Yeah, you she know, in the first for her year. Mom. I'm sorry. Go ahead. She bought some for her mom, and where is she? In a nursing home. Which she said yeah, I used to pop right. one up for my mother every year, and and just think now I could have just brought her three, and just set them around her little apartment. That would have been so fun. In cute antique bowls. Yeah, and cute. Yeah, they do. I gotta say, they do look better in bowls to me, but that's just me. I was also gonna say that the first year I bought some, I ordered them because I couldn't find them here locally. Right. And they arrived with all their wax cracked off, but they yeah, figured that out. Doesn't happen yes, anymore. That's true. So the next thing we wrote was getting amaryllis to rebloom. And short of us going through all the, you know, they basically oh. go through a dormant period and then you can get them to rebloom. I went out to John Sheepers, which is an excellent place to buy unusual varieties of amaryllis. 
and we'll link to their Amaryllis page. We do not have an affiliate link. It's just because we like we our just listeners. like them. Yes. And we like to help our listeners. But the people at John Sheepers are really nice. They have a full article all about growing amaryllis, where, you know, from the get go to dormancy so that they could rebloom. Because some of those amaryllis bulbs, I probably would want them to rebloom because, yeah, they're expensive, but, and they're pretty. You know, I just compost mine. But so do you have any favorites? You know what? The, my favorites right now are the red ones from Costco. There's white ones too, Carol, online. Oh, well. And, and they have white wax. They're you so are, cute. You are the temptresses of all temptresses. And, you know, and now let me, let me back up and explain that the amaryllis that I saw in pots at Costco, why I didn't buy it. They had put that grayish Spanish moss on top. And last year, when I bought hellebores, when Christmas roses at Home Depot, they had that Spanishy moss on top. It holds the water on the soil so it doesn't dry out. It is a breeding ground for gnats, fruit flies, yeah. and gnats. And I, I had the worst infestation last year, and I, I'm like, where are these coming from? And I finally realized it was those hellebores with that Spanish moss. So if yeah. I were going to buy the ones that had like pull Spanish moss, I I pull it off, I would throw it away mm -hmm. and I would really let that top dry off and I might put some grit like you said on top be because otherwise you could end up with gnats for Christmas. Nobody wants that. How fun. How special. You don't have any favorites other than the Costco ones, right? You know, I've just never I at one time, I bought one that had like a greenish flower because, you know, I'm freaked on the color green. Oh, and I love the green ones. They're pretty. I still have it. I don't, it, it flowers like every once in a while, but I'm not very good about mm -hmm. the whole dormancy thing. But I see you have a favorite. I do. I've got a new one I'm trying this year and I'll let people know. And it's white and it's supposed to be dwarf. But my favorite is a class. I like the dwarf ones. And here's yes. why. They don't fall over. You no. don't have to stake them. You just put them in the pot, let them grow, enjoy them, and then do whatever you want to with them. I am tired. I have one out there that I have to stake, and it has driven me crazy. I it's like because what happens is when they bloom, those big tall ones, they bloom one bloom, and it's about half finished when the second one uh -huh. comes up, and then I'll be darned. One of them flops one way, the other one flops another way. I do have a whole, I've written so many blog posts on growing amaryllis inside. And there is a way to do that. You just put bamboo and then you tie stuff around it and all that. But sometimes at this season, especially, I just want to enjoy stuff and not have to work at it so hard. Oh, I agree. So one of the dwarf ones out there is Miracle. It's wonderful. Last year, I grew a dwarf one that is white and a double, but I don't remember the name of it. But if you just look up double white dwarf amaryllis, it'll come right up. If you got some now, if you were able to find some still, they would not bloom until January probably, but who cares? You've already put everything away for Christmas. January is really pretty with white because of snow, because of winter, you know, blue skies. It looks good, right? And exactly. so I think like my white ones right now that I potted up, are just sitting there. So I know they aren't going to bloom for Christmas. No. So I'll just put them on my mantle in January and that's fun. So I, and the green ones are great, but there, I don't think there are any dwarf green ones yet. No, yet. no. Now One I'm looking really pretty red one. I like is Piketty because it has that white edge. What were you going to say? I'm looking at the Costco website right now. They have three oh. online only. They have a silver wax with red. Oh, pretty. They have a gold wax with red. Pretty. And then they have one that's got a light blue, dark blue, and white with a white bloom. I want that one. But I'm going to put it in a bowl with moss anyway. So what difference does it make? And they're, but they're not $21.99 anymore. They're $37.99. Oh, I'm not buying those. I'm done. I'm done buying that thing. No, I'm finished. Oh, I want to say one more thing about Amaryllis before we get to the Family Handyman article, which I think the title is hilarious. But okay. So one more thing. What was it? Oh, there is a company. I will not say who it is, and I but I got their catalog. 
So if you're a gardener, you got it too. And they show lots and lots of gifts of amaryllis. Okay. And that's uh-huh. it, it is so expensive, ridiculously uh-huh. expensive. Yes. Use that catalog for ideas and then just go buy your own bulbs. Cause literally the moss I bought, I bought three packages. It was $4 and something a package. And I already have a bowl. Everybody's got a bowl or a planter or something. And they and my amaryllis were cheap. This they were selling stuff for $150. And all it yeah. is is a kit. It's a kit. So don't buy those. That's all. All right. Now the actual name of the article is how to keep amaryllis alive after Christmas. Oh, okay. So it's not as dumb. And and I wrote it. <laughs> Well, I know the articles, I knew you did. And it's not that the article's dumb. It's those dumb titles they made us do. Yes, yes, yes. So anyway, we'll we'll link to that just for grins and jollies and all that. Why don't you do a quote and talk about the vegetable You have to topic. tell our future. Are you going to tell our future topic or is it teaser? No, that's kind of, well. Notes to you? It's notes to us, but, you know, there is another Family Handyman article that I ran across that I think would be a terrific topic for us. So we'll just leave it at that. And now you'll do a quote. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. And that's Mary Oliver. And I thought it was beautiful. It is beautiful. So you came up with the topic for our next vegetable topic, unusual herbs. And you said, let's start with holy basil. Well, I mean, it's the holy season, right? Get it? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I get it. I get it. Okay. So holy basil and i sorry, I tried to do something and it just messed everything up. All right. So holy basil. And you said that you, when you went to look for it, you found that there were two different kinds. Well, I, first of all, when I went and did a search for holy basil, there are page after page after page of medical information of the purported yeah. benefits from a medical standpoint. And we yeah. are not going to talk about any of those. Our listeners are oh, smart gosh, enough no. to do that search. But I did find that Osimum sanctum and Osimum tenuiflorum, tenuiflorum, that's the two names that you'll see with reference to holy basil. And I think they're the same. I think they're the same thing. And it's common name which I didn't realize for a long time, is Tulsi. And so you see uh, you see everywhere now Tulsi tea because yes. it's very, very popular. Of course, I have any time. Yeah, I do too. And it's supposed to help relax you. And that's why people drink Tulsi tea, among other things. And a lot of people do take it medicinally. But I have grown it. Have you ever grown it? You know, I... I might have grown it. I don't remember. I mean, it may have been a herb that I started from seed and then just forgot through the hustle and bustle of the summertime. But it's just as easy to grow as any other basil. Sow some seeds, let it come up. Grow it exactly the same way. It's a summer plant. So easy to grow. Here's the thing. I didn't notice mine for months. I was just like, yeah, okay, it's sitting there. Then it started to bloom. And it has really tiny little blooms. Uh-huh. But they're the most iridescent purple. And it is the most beautiful color. Because, you know, basils have different colors. Right, right. And the bees adore it. So that's a good reason to grow it, too. I would say if you're going to harvest it, harvest the leaves before it blooms, like any other herb. Sure. And you can dry them and make your own Tulsi tea. I found that I kind of fell in love with those blooms that year. It was about three years ago. I took picture after picture with the sunlight behind it because they Uh have a real iridescence. I'll see if I can find one. They are beautiful and it makes a beautiful plant. It grows kind of in a vase shape. So it's a little different than some of the basils. And if you like to take care of pollinators, it is a bee magnet. I, you know, I think I actually have some seeds left over from when I've grown it before and I... I am going to check that out, which reminds me, I need to, before I just start willy-nilly ordering seeds like I'm Dean Nash, I'm going to, I'm going to make a little spreadsheet of all the seeds I have 
and I may not grow some of them, but at least I will have reference to say, don't, don't buy that because okay. I have enough. I have mine all in my little keepers. I used a lot of my seeds last year. Okay. So one thing I wanted to say about it is it is used a lot in Thai food. It thai is. basil is too. And actually they look similar in appearance, but it is a bigger plant than Thai basil. It is native to India. You found that, and it's sacred in the Hindu religion tradition, which I didn't know. And so it's considered, oh, okay. So it's considered one of the most significant plants in the Ayurvedic medicine, which is related to yoga. There's a lot of claims about its physical medicinal properties. I know a lot of people with MCAS, which is mast cell activation syndrome, use Tulsi as part of their medicinal cabinet, you know, as a help. And I also know that you can get it through Gaia Herbs because Gaia Herbs has tinctures. So it's an interesting plant. I'm not saying it has, I have no idea about its medicinal value, but I know it's really, you know, it's really, really good in the garden. It's pretty. Yeah. And you you made a point here. You wrote that it's it does really well in containers. And like you said, those little purple flowers, ornamental appeal, pollinator appeal. And so totally. that... I'm going to add it back to my list to grow, and then we'll include a leaf, a link. Well, you can just go to our affiliate link for Two Leaf Market if you want to order some seeds. They have the seeds there. Actually, and that helps up, us too. Yeah. I looked up to see if it was something you could grow as microgreens, and they don't have any microgreen seeds for it. And they're actually sold out of their basil microgreen seeds. So I'm like, oh, okay. Huh. I think people really like to use microgreen basil to top dishes because it gives all that good fresh flavor. Yeah, because it's very, very flavorful when you grow regular basil. I don't know about holy basil, but regular basil as a microgreen. So the, the birds are at my bird feeder and they are just so happy today. So happy. And That's by the good. way, the squirrel baffles are working pretty good. I yeah, mean, we had good. one get up there, but not like they were. Gosh, it was terrible. It was like the squirrels from four counties came over here. Okay, ready for the next quote? I'm going to do it now. To learn to read is to light a fire. Victor Hugo, Les Miserables. Good job on the Les Miserables. You're welcome. I did take two years of French in high school. You did. And I think it's Victor Hugo, but I who knows, right? I mean, that's all I've ever heard, but I don't know. All right. On the bookshelf. Yes, I saw this. This is the Botanist Library, the most important botanical books in history by Carolyn Fry and Emma Whalen, and it's from Ivy Press, which is a quarto imprint. So mm -hmm. I reached out to our publicist contact there, and I said, could you send us this book to review? Because it looks like it's right up Dee and Carol's alley. And so we are grateful that they have sent us review copies. This is quite the book, Dee. And let me just tell you, let me, let me tell you that it goes from ancient times to present day, and it goes through a history of the most important books in the history of botany and yeah. lots of illustrations. And the titles of the chapters are early texts show emerging knowledge of plants. And that's ancient times to 1450. And then right. the coming of print is 1450 to 1600. And right. then 1600 to 1750 is botanists strive to know and classify more plants. 1750 to 1830, the global and the local. 1830 to 1950, botany becomes a science. And 1950 to present day, the modern botanist library takes shape. And the two authors are, D, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be looking at their bios because it is just added to the list of books that I want to check out. Sure. So Carolyn Fry is a journalist and author specializing in science, environment, and botanical exploration. She's written or co-authored 11 books, including Seeds, Safeguarding Our Future. I read the Seeds book. Plants, From Roots to Riches. The Plant, the Plant Hunters, The Adventures of the World's Greatest Botanical Explorers. I think I actually have that book. I've read that one, too. Mm-hmm. She has contributed news stories and articles to multiple magazines and national newspapers. And then Emma Whalen is a journalist, writer, and editor. She did postgraduate research at Imperial College in London in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at Cambridge. 
She's concerned how Victorian gardeners made use of new scientific ideas. She wrote a book in 2009 called Darwin's Dogs and is co-author of that Plants from Roots to Riches and another book called Plant Words from 2022. And I'm like, what is this book, Plant Words? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know that one. I will say this book, I mean, I know it's my minor contribution. I haven't read it yet. I haven't had time. The cover. The cover is what attracted me. It's a sunflower against a blue sky. So if you have someone in your life who cares about the history of gardening and and the botanical contribution to it, namely the botanists, this would be a great book for them. It is yeah. not one that I will be sitting down and reading in I mean intensively. I will take it's a it's a very well researched like reference book for me. Yes. And the way I'm going to read it, Dee, because I've just started, I'm just going to start with the first section and I'm going to go through each of those time periods. It'll probably take me through the winter because I have to intersperse it with other books, of course. Yeah. Once a week. Yeah. (laughs) But But I think it's interesting that they took on such a, such an expansive topic because you're trying to decide what books were the most important. That is, but I, I have to admit, it. I, I'm impressed. I'm so impressed. And also, I love that they start with the plants that healed ancient Egyptians. Because Egyptians, they had better medicine than other groups of people of their time. And a lot of it had to do with botany. So, and now they're going to talk about the roots of India's Ayurveda, or Ayurveda. I don't know how it's pronounced. I think it's Veda. And that's, you know, that goes, takes us back to our holy basil again. It does. So and so everything from, comes back to gardening, Carol. Everything. It does. It does. And so from the description, each chapter delves into the pages of a seminal work, unveiling the insights, controversies, and stories behind the books that have shaped our understanding of the plant world. Whether you are a seasoned botanist, a budding enthusiast, or simply someone with an, an insatiable curiosity about the natural world, The Botanist Library offers a comprehensive reference that will enrich your understanding of botany and its evolution. And Dee, I I am so glad to have this book. I can't wait to dive in because, you know, with history and all that stuff. And I I was just looking, (laughs) there was a a picture of a book, Jane Loudon wrote books. Yeah. Remember her? I do remember her. Anyway, Um, there's a picture on page, it's on page 230. 201. I don't know why I wanted to say 2001. But she wrote a book called Botany for Ladies, 1842. And, and just the title page, I would love to have a print of the title page just to put up on the wall somewhere, just, just the way right? it is. It's so pretty. I mean, it's plain, but pretty. Anyway. Oh, yeah. That I am sweet. fascinated by this book. I am excited by this book, D, and I... And pleased to add it to my reading pile for the winter. And that is The Botanist Library, The Most Important Botanical Books in History by Carolyn Fry and Emma Wayland. And let me double check. I think it just came out this year. I think it did too. And I don't know how, you know, it just, you know, those silly algorithms. They just sort of, it's 2024. Yeah, it came out this year. But the algorithm online said, Carol, you need this book. So, well, anyway. and that cover, that cover is beautiful. I mean, no wonder you were attracted to it. And it, it is extensively researched. I, I will be reading it too, in between everything else. Okay, so when we do the next quote, please. December is the time for remembering the past and reaching toward the future. Ralph Waldo Emerson. And our dirt this week, we got from a listener who is on the Garden Angels Garden Club, and she shared this with us. And it's called how Honeycrisp Apples went from marvelous to mediocre. And I thought when she said it, gave it to me, I was thinking to myself, yeah, I, I hate them. <laughs> so we will link to the article that she sent to us. So the simple answer was these apples were developed in, in Minnesota for the right. winter climates of Minnesota. And there it's a great regional apple. You get it in the fall. It's, it was crisp. It was delicious. But in order for an apple to make it in the world, the most apple production is in Washington State. So they started growing these in Washington State, 
And then they found out that because of the thin skin, these do not store as well as others. And as they store, they, they also just, don't thrive. The no. tree itself does not thrive no. in anywhere except for the north part of the United States, the northern United States in the center. And it and that's an important thing. That really brings it back to gardening. But go ahead. They store them and they taste like crap. They store them and they taste like crap. And this, so they've overproduced them. You know, when you invest in a bunch of trees, you don't just like, well, this turned out to be bad. They just kept working through all the problems, figuring out how to store it. And so now it's, in my words, over overproduced, overstored. And in storage, it becomes just one of those commodity apples. And yeah. it's a bust. And that's too bad. But what I have noted, and it's not in this because this is from an article in Serious Eats, which is just talking about this apple and the taste of it. But what has happened is they have taken that apple and and there's a reason you guys should go read this article. It's that good. The reason it tastes so good is about the spacing of the cells within the apple. That's part of it. Okay. So uh-huh. now they've taken this honey crisp and they've made it the parent of all these other apples that are on the market. The Ever Crisp, the Cosmic Crisp, I could go on. There are so many crisps, right? I think it's even in the parentage of Envy somewhere, but maybe wrong on that one. But all of these very crunchy apples that have a lot of juice and a lot of flavor. So it's not all bad news about the Honey Crisp, but as usual, in my opinion, greed got us to where the Honey Crisp, because when it first came out, it was good. Now you eat it and then you go, that's disappointing. Well, the other thing is, you know, if if you eat an apple in the spring, you're eating an apple that has been stored for a long time. Because yeah, apples, eat something else. Yeah. And that, that goes to like, can you eat app, eat fruit in season or figure hmm. out how to preserve your harvest with applesauce or something like that? So. And you wrote on here another thing, location, location, location. It's a great apple in Minneapolis or Minnesota. It's not a great apple in Washington State. And we don't need a certain apple, you know, 365 days of the year. Correct. We just don't. No. And so, like, for example, when the Envy apple first came out, it was only for this little short time. And, like, everybody ran and bought it because it is a fabulous apple. But I've noticed late, lately it's not as good as it was. And they're doing the same thing with it. It's they're one of the really it. popular apples. They're overstoring it, probably growing it in the wrong places. So I, I want to thank, I can't, I'm sorry, I didn't write down the name. I want to thank her for sending us that because that was a very interesting article. All right, I'll do a quote. We'll do rabbit holes. It's delightful when your imaginations come true, isn't it? Ellen Montgomery in Anne of Green Gables. And by the way, Dee, I am ready to read, listen to the sixth Anne of Green Gables novel. I've only done one. There's six in the series, then two more that she wrote about Anne of Green Gables children. So that's cool. I'm glad that there are so many out there. So my rabbit hole is I've been down in the Advent rabbit hole for quite a while. And I've been reading this wonderful book by Sarah Clarkson called Reclaiming Quiet. I've loved it so much. I've sent little snippets of it to you, to Amy, to Debbie, to a lot of my friends I've posted about it on Instagram and on Instagram, she is Sarah Wanders and she is the daughter of Sally Clarkson and Sally Clarkson is an evangelical Christian who lives in the United States. And I don't remember what her exact faith is, but she's very popular, a very popular writer. She and Sarah have written some stuff together. The, the way I found out about them was that they were the writers in residence at Victoria Magazine uh-huh. one year. And I really enjoyed their writings and their take on things. Sarah married someone who was in the Anglican seminary and they ended up, she ended up moving to England. I don't know if she met, she was in England before she met. I don't know that part, but anyway, they're in England together. He finished seminary. The first chapter of this book is just so lovely it'll bring tears to your eyes. That's how good it is. And it's about finding quiet in a very loud world. And the opening chapter is about the kitchen table. So that's all I'm going to say about that. I've enjoyed it so much. It always fits into what you and I always talk about, about putting down our phones, finding some time for yourself. So there's that. And then I had forgotten all about her connection to Sally and all that stuff. 
And then my friend, Mary Louise, reminded me that they're mother and daughter. So she's also not Mary Louise. She doesn't have time. She's too busy. But Sarah is running an Advent. I don't know. It's four, four thingies. I don't know, four meetings. And you can get them through a link on either her website. And I know it's on Instagram because I looked at it. I think it's $25 for them. And it's kind of a meditative thing. I haven't done it. But I have been doing Ascension Press, which is Catholic, has a deal with Father Michael Schmitz, who's very, very popular. He's a very popular priest, very good speaker. He's been doing an Advent series on Ascension Press's app, which they now have. And I joined it. But as much as I love love Father Schmitz, and I do, I'm really enjoying Sarah's approach to Advent, only because... Sarah's is all about quietness. Father Michael is very energetic. So I think there's an advent for everybody out there. There um, is. No matter what faith, you know, you're in. And it's just been really a fun, fun rabbit hole. How about you? Oh, so you're, you, you have touched on one of my great oh, loves. Okay, go ahead. I love them. Go ahead. Myst- mystery writers from the 1930s. So I... I have an account on NetGalley, and you can get advanced reader copies of books that are coming out as long as you review them, like on Goodreads and Amazon and everything. Oh, my gosh. I love, I want that book. So I read and reviewed an advanced copy of The, the Queens of Crime by Marie Benedict, oh. who is an excellent author. The book comes out in February 11th, 2025. Let me read you the big, oh what it's gosh, about. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait to read this. London, 1930, the five greatest women crime writers have banded together to form a secret society with a single goal, to show they are no longer willing to be treated as second-class citizens by their male counterparts in the legendary Detection Club. (laughs) Led by the formidable Dorothy L. Sayers, the group includes Agatha Christie, Nagayo, I think it's Nayo, I think it's Nayo, Nayo Marsh, Nayo Nayo Marsh. She's from New Zealand. Marjorie yeah, Allingham. I know she is. I've read her. And Baroness Emma or- Orczy. They call themselves the Queens of Crime. Their plan? Fine. Solve an actual murder that that of a young woman found strangled in a park in France who may have connections leading to the highest levels of the British establishment. And of course, I read that and it's really an enjoyable, it's a good book. I looked up all those authors. It could be the biggest. I- Longest reading yeah. list of my life to read some of those. I want to read mysteries by. I'm of course I've read Agatha Christie and I I read I've read Dorothy. Niall Marsh and I've read Dorothy. I don't think I've read I've Niall Marsh. Read, I've never yeah. read Baroness Emma, Emma Orksy and I've never read Marjorie Allingham. Cool. Baroness Emma book. Orksy is the Scarlet Pimper Pimpernel. Oh, that's so funny. Okay, so the Scarlet Pimpernel. Yeah, I should have known this. I know her, I think, great-great-niece. We've talked about this before. She has the rights to it. And so she gets, not not in the United States, it's common, you know, in the commons, but it's still available in the, in the, in Europe. And so she still gets, she still owns it. She owns the rights. Isn't that cool? It is cool. And then. Her name's Sarah. So anyway, we'll put a link to that Queens of Crime in case anybody wants to like pre-order it or, you know, watch for it to show up at your library. It's really a good read. So many books to read. So many good books. And then I went to the used bookstore, Half Price Books, and they had a 1944 Atlas, great big green book. And I thought, I need this because... First of all, there's a specific map in there that I need for my special secret Christmas project. Okay. But someone put in the pages of the Atlas an article by a woman named Patricia Easterbrook Roberts. Do you know her? What did she write? She wrote books about flower arranging. I don't know. She originally was from Australia, but immigrated to the United States and actually taught classes up there in Detroit area. And she wrote several books on flower arranging, and somebody had tucked an article about her in there. And even though you can readily find information about her, I'm going to make her a lost lady of garden writing. Okay. And then that big atlas will sit on my coffee table, because it is kind of cool to see an atlas from 1944. It is, it's kind of cool. That's really cool. I like it. Yeah. So So on to garden commissions. 
Mine's plain, but I can tell you what it is. What I'm going to get those bulbs planted, even if I have to go out there in the cold, which will be fine. I mean, it's right by my door. In the cold at midnight with a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to get them in. It's time. It's way past time. So I got to do that. Keep the house plants watered every Sunday. Enjoy my amaryllis, which are coming along. I mean, I got to put up my tree. That's it. So I truly do plan to restart my microgreen farm indoors. I tend to the house plants this weekend. I need to clean up some leaves that are now in big piles along the fence because of the wind. And if I get all that done, then I'm going to call the week a success. I figure if we just make it through the next couple of weeks before Christmas and do it well, we're doing great. I'm actually thinking about having a cookie party with my daughters and my son, if he wants to come. He cooks too. But it came up because one of my, and I know this isn't about gardening, but who cares? My one, I said that I'd made snickerdoodles because Brennan came over to visit last night on his way home. And then my daughter, Ashley, texted me and she goes, hey, wait a minute, those are my favorite cookie too. And I said, I did not know that. I just knew it was his favorite cookie. So that, I said, I'll just send you some. And she goes, no, I just was giving you a hard time. You know, kidding, right? And right. then we chatted about that. And then I, I said, I should ask Claire what her favorite cookie is. I know Megan's is peanut butter. And so I, I got this idea after I wrote Claire and I thought, and Claire's, I don't know if anybody wants to know, but it's chocolate chip, oatmeal, chocolate chip, peanut butter, and then snickerdoodle. So she likes them all, which is just so typical of Claire. And her husband likes snickerdoodle. I think my, I think Megan's husband likes snickerdoodle. So I think it'd be fun to have a cookie party with my kids. It would. And it sounds like you need to be, make about four batches of snickerdoodles. Yes. And a couple of peanut butter and a couple of chocolate chip. That'd be well, fun. It would be fun. So to give you time to do that, we're going to wrap up this podcast recording. Thank you for listening to The Garden Angelus. I hope you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. We publish every week on Wednesdays at 12 a.m. Eastern Time. If you subscribe to our free Substack newsletter, you'll get a link to listen to the podcast a whole day early. If you want to help support us, use our affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we earn a small commission and it costs you nothing. Or if you're so inclined, you can set up a monthly subscription through Buzzsprout or make a one-time donation through PayPal. Thank you to everyone who has done so. It helps us pay for podcast hosting. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate this week. Until next time, have a lovely, lovely advent. Bye, everybody.